in uh, 1915, must have been in June. They came and uh, encircled the village at night. And we did not know anything about it, no notice or anything. The Turks, they come and close the schools. All my teachers disappeared. All our poets, writers, and all famous people was carried away. They never came back. Of course, before that, they took all the, the lawyers and the doctors, they took it away first. By the end of July, the order came out that we had to leave our homes. Turkish people made an announcement, all Armenian, whoever is left in there, it has to be moved from here. There will be no Armenian left in Turkish people. The Abe is at 80% of the wealth. They had 80% of the business. 90% of the Turks were illiterate. The Abe has with the merchants. And the entire, you know, city life, uh, commerce was in the hands of Armenians. Now, when they told the Turks, you can kill him, loot everything you can, it was a blessing for them to cram. So we were at our home, and we were having dinner in the basement floor when we heard screaming in the household next door. And the Turks had attacked and were raping the woman there and killing the husband. But you know what my grandfather used to say? If it wasn't for the good Turks, we wouldn't be alive today. They came and warned them Please, don't look for anything. Just go. And that's what they did. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been saved. Uh, they came and knocked on the doors, and they said, get whatever you can, go to the church, you know, and hide. The only place of refuge that the Armenians had were churches. So we just left the table. We didn't touch the food at all. We snuck out of the basement window. The Turks had carte blanche to do anything they wanted in the city, to arrest, to kill, to rape, to burn. As soon, the whole city was in flames. So they sent it to church, and a priest get up, and he said, my people, we had very bad news for you. They started telling us, they said that, suppose that they're going to transfer us someplace else. Uh, nothing going to happen with our home. That's what they told the priest and the board of trustee men. You could lock your door. Nothing is going to happen. When the war is stopped, you're going to come back. Just. Take little things wherever you want to take it. They give us tw not even 24 hours. And then the next thing I knew was that we had evacuated. We had to leave our house so they could confiscate all the belongings that we had. So what I saw with my own eyes the Turkish gendarme to come, break into all the homes, put them up to the street, and march them away. That will always remain with me. started, they took my father, the Turks, took my father in the army or something, and uh, they killed him. The young were conscripted into the army first, and the elderly people were 
dumped into prisons for various alibis. My uncle and my uncle's sons, they were tied together, they were going to die. They were taking him to kill. All the men they were taken and killed. They took my father away and I held on to his jacket at that time. And I said, my father isn't going anywhere. Where are you taking him? But of course, he had no choice. And they uh, put him in jail. And uh, somebody told me, told us, that you, we saw you, they shot your father. He was running in the forest and they shot him. And they cut his neck. So me and my sister, we went, we got the head, we buried it. My father went, and that was the end of it. Then about two or three hours later, they brought all their clothes into the marketplace and sold them at auction. And all the buyers were Turks, because there were no Armenians left. And for the first time in centuries, we left our home. Now from our home, we started walking. They brought a, a donkey. They put two canvases on each side of the donkey, and they put me in one side. I don't know who they put on the other side. On top of me, they put the little kids. They piled it on me. We started walking. I walk. I don't know how many hours I walk, walk, finally. They pushed in a mosque, and they converted us to Islamism. They started to say a few prayers in Turkish. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And the next thing I know, my name was changed from Hagop to Khairi, Bakhtiyar Oğlu, instead of Bakhtiyar Yan. And from there on, we walked. I was walking with my mother, and we saw a gathering in a square. And you know what I saw? Three people hang. I got so scared that I got sick. I got not theirs. When we took, when we took a walk, we would see people hanging by the rope. And we lost my grandfather over there. Within one day, he had a stroke. And from there on, we walked. And nothing to eat, nothing to wear, whatever we had on, that's all we had. And that we didn't even have money because they didn't give us time to take any money from the house. We just left whatever we had on. We used to go from one village to the other. There were stopping points. We would stop somewhere, and the Turks and the Kurds would come, attack the group, and get whatever they could get. And whatever they could get mostly was boys and beautiful girls. My mother used to hide me in clothes so that they would kidnap me. And then one time, gendarmes came, so they were going to just kill everybody. And to any Armenian, the gendarme is always bad news. And then one of them took the musket and tried to kill me. I was nine years old. And my mother said, Effendi, that's, he, he's just a boy. He came and he stopped killing me. They have a ditch dug already. They have prepared everything. They each got a big hook like this wooden hook. 
They drag the bodies, drop it in, the, in that ditch out there. They kill everyone. They kill everyone. Yeah. The smell was so heavy that a lot of people got sick. They dropped them all in there and burned them up, all the kids. And then they were looking for us too. My mother ran from me, and I didn't know where she went, it was dark. And one gendarme, he put me down, just like chicken, you know. He put his feet on my legs and my hands, and he was asking me in Turkish, of course, where did that woman go? about my mother. I said, I don't know. Honest to God, I said, I don't know where she went. And my poor mother, she was hearing. And then when I said like this, he had his uh, thing, his sword. So I have a scar over here of his sword. So after he went, there was another lady running around. So he left me there. He ran after the other woman. So I went and found my mother again. He. He had a, one young woman, she was uh, pregnant. So he bothered down. The poor girl, she's crying, let me go, let me go. Well, he had something else in his mind. I was standing there, you know, with my mother, you know, and all of a sudden I think he tear the girl's dress, cut the stomach and pull the baby out. Oh, that I never forget. I, I see so many things, but that was it. Pull the baby out. Baby scream. Couple ladies, they fainted. Then baby cry. So he chopped the head, so he don't want to hear it. But the other soldiers, they had the machine gun on us. If anybody move, we're going to kill every one of you. They start shooting each direction. Bullets come and go all over. Bullets come each direction. I'm ducking, you know, I just walk. People falling down, I walk right over. And somebody ordered us to take shelter behind the boulders. Well, after about 10 minutes, there seemed to be no end to it. Fortunately, at that spot there, there's a break in that perpendicular wall on the right side of the valley. And they started climbing that opening there of the valley. Mom says, we haven't got anything to eat. I know it. She said, son, we are going to go away from here. We're not going to wait over here. She said, I'm going to go back to some Kurdish people village, see if I can get some bread or cheese or something, you know, for, for uh. And then my brother, he used to find food for us. So I was left alone there with my mother. And then we didn't have nothing, and then there was a barn over there with the horses in there. So my mother went, please give us a place to stay for the evening. So they gave us with the horses, and the horses were eating whatever they were eating. We ate the, whatever they had, we ate with the horses. My mother had the eight-month-old baby, and she said, Arika, hold this baby one minute. And that was her end, and she died. And I don't remember. I started crying. I was seven years old. I never forget that. I stopped my cry. It's impossible to forget all that. These are impressions that hit you so hard. It's impossible for anybody to forget. I took my own mother. We put her on a bed sheet, and we took him. To, we took her to the uh, to the well. Pushed, 
pushed in, fought foot first. But it was an awful sight. Millions and millions of flies at the uh, mouth of the well. Somehow something held me. I stayed there to see how she would be falling down. As the other part was heavier, down part of it, her head hit once, one side of the uh, stone, and then the other side, and then sank down. Then I ran away. Well, I didn't feel much at the time because in a situation like that, you always think that uh, tomorrow it's your turn. There's no point in, uh, uh, in thinking about it. In... But you never forget those experiences. You are not a child anymore. Any child going through uh, calamity like that is not a child. He is a grown-up person. That experience in itself, it's, it can never be written about, it can never be explained as to what experience that is. Because uh, all the cruelty in the world is concentrated on that person. And you can't, you can't forget it. You can't forget these experiences. And we walked 40 days from our village to Aleppo, Syria, 40 days. When we went the Arabian desert, that's the worst thing that started. Yeah. Because we see so many people got killed. And they make us the walk among the people that they're dead already and they tell us we're going to die like them. You know, we walk 1,000 here, 2,000 there, 3,000 there. There is no stitch of clothes on them. The people that they kill, they make them take their clothes out. That's the way it was. We walk in the desert. My feet is all bleeding and sore and thing. Hot sun up there, hot sun down here. No hot water. Very seldom we come across the water in the desert. See, no food. Sometimes we starve in two, three days. Sickness, hunger, and lice. It was an awful thing because there was no water to keep clean or to wash or to even drink. We did not have much anything to eat. And it was to such a thing that sometimes you see a camel dead and in the field over there, a big carcass when a uh, camel, you see children going into it and trying to, uh, uh, to pluck out any meat that is left inside. It was a terrible scene. I have gone into the uh, street hunting for a bone in order to break it to, to, to suck it out. And that way, uh, you're, you fool yourself eating something. I was all by myself in the, de it's a desert too. 
I, I'm calling mom, dad, I run here and I run there. I can't find anybody. I hear some voice. I thought it was my mother and them, they coming back for me. The Spanish says, Tuna, uh, you are Armenian and you haven't got nothing to eat. He says, I'm going to help you out. I, I don't, I don't want to say anybody I am an Armenian because I, I, I don't know who he is. He's Turk or what? I raised my hand and I said, somebody help me, give me a little bread I eat. I would have died. There I see a bunch of Arabs with their donkeys and things. So when I saw them, I got scared and I started running. One lady, she ran and she catch me. She tell me something in the Arab, don't be scared, we're not going to kill you. And this woman, she says, well, I'll take her, you know. Then she came and she looked at me and she pat me in my head. And then she says, me and you, I'm going to take you. So that's the way I went, the Arab house. And the Arabs came, the Bedouins, and they came to see if they, we have any junk to pick it up. So this man, he was so kind, he gave his uh, pillow or whatever he had on, he put it on us. He said, Yalla, come on. So he took us to his tent. So that's how we were survived. In the evening, we, would, we used to sit down and uh, tell experience, our experiences, to go through it every night, almost. And there was no two boys having the same experience. Every one of them had something different. And you thought that yours was the worst, but there were worse ones yet. In 1918, when I, uh, I ran away from the desert and came to Jerusalem, there I was put in an orphanage. I escaped from the Turks. Then I went to an orphanage. They put us in the orphanage. My mother, father, my gra grandfather was killed. So my grandmother had to work. She put me in an orphanage. And when I was five years old, she came and got me. <laughs> we went to the orphanage. And then from there, they used to, you know, put to, to the villages. Like I went to Saida, they sent me to Saida. Some of went to Juni, some of went to Khazir. I went in Khazir orphanage. We, they used to give us bread and something, orange or something they or something, but we went to school over there too. We were very safe over there because there was no church. When I rested for a while, I had three meals a day. I felt safe. Then you start thinking, and the most poignant part of the whole experience that naved me constantly. What kind of a son to take his mother and drop her without any remorse? And it just kept on naving, naving for years. Have you ever seen 10,000 people eating in one island on benches? The food was on benches because there was no other way of feeding him. We had enough to not to die, not to starve. That's all. From there, for the first time, at the age of 10, let's say, I uh, sat on a bench and I was listening to a teacher uh, giving us lessons in Armenian, reading. That the same hospital, the same orphanage, 
I remember very clearly that by our first dinner, we they had the restaurant, like dining room, and uh, we sat there, they served us meal. We didn't know, we haven't seen a fork at that time, or a spoon, or a knife. And the meal I remember also was a spaghetti. The director of the orphanage was Mampre Serpazan Sinunyan. He sat near me, I remember, and showed us how to use a fork, how to use a knife to eat. And there was also something black on the table. We didn't know what was that. There were black olives. So he showed us how to eat the <laughs> black olives. Every orphanage, you know, they take where we born, what's our name, what's our parents' name and the thing. They take our names. When the priest gave the sermon, he read it. He says, so-and-so kids, survivor. If any friend, any relative or anybody, she has it, you could come and get her, you know. My paternal family heard that I was alive and I, I was back. They were deported from other sections. We didn't, don't know where they went. So uh, one of my aunts that survived li uh, came and took me. And she raised me until I was six, 15. I came here to this country. I took a steamer ride from Mersin to uh, Smyrna. At that time, it was in Greek hands yet, in, in 1920. From there to Greece, and from Greece to America. Well, I was on a steamer that from Piraeus in Greece to New York took 30 days, 30 days in the boat. It's a terrible, terrible ride. And when I came here, I had to come through the Ellis Island at that time. People always, all of them came through Ellis Island. One night I slept over there. Well, my uncle came over and uh, they picked me, picked me up and brought home. October 12, 1916, we landed in Ellis Island. And the first thing my father did, he says, get me a banana. He brought, gave my brother, my, myself one. And I didn't know how to eat bananas. I had never seen bananas in my life. I went and started a bite. He said, no, 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 you have to peel the skin off. And we landed in America. Uh, eventually, we landed at Ellis Island. I remember that very clearly. I have to say, I enjoyed my 12 to 14 days in Ellis Island. I personally enjoyed it. When we got off the boat that brought us from the King Alexander to the island, there was an officer there handing out sandwiches. For the first time, I enjoyed a boiled ham sandwich on white bread with butter. It was heavenly. Uh, I, I was so hungry, and I never tasted anything like this. We don't eat uh, ham in Marash, and we don't have white bread, and we had no butter for ages. <laughs> Uh, well, I was put in, uh, in uh, with my three sisters. I was to live with my three sisters. And we were there 11, 12 days. And there was some question about my father and mother being sent back because my father's eyes were no good. And uh, when I came, nobody came to greet me. There wasn't anybody. So they took me to Ellis Island. And uh, I stayed there seven days. It seems that, that my mother had made a mistake. She thought I was coming the next week. 
So I stayed in Ellis Island because I, I, I knew French. I didn't know any English or anything. I could read and write French and, and Armenian. So in uh, there was benches there in the hall, and uh, every day on the loudspeaker, people's names would come. Whose ever parent or uh, was going to pick them up, they came and they would call them, and, and they would go to an office, and people would make you read or something, you know, make sure it's the same person. So one day, finally, after seven days, my name came, and I went in the uh, in the office. And of course, there were other people too waiting to be interviewed. I sat there, and every time uh, the door opened, some woman would come in, and I would say, I wonder if that's my mother. So, anyway, they, she came. Now, I, lately, I remember that because I never knew my mother, I had never seen my mother and all. I was just an infant. There was no hug, no nothing. We were strangers to each other. So they picked me up, and they, I came here and went to school, got married. We came with the boat. President Wilson boat. And all I know is when everybody saw the Statue of Liberty, they just went crazy. And my grandmother thought, maybe somebody kicked me because I'm a little girl, kicked me and threw me in the water. When she saw me, she just hugged me. Well, well through all the miseries that a refugee has to go, I came here 10 years old. I had no schooling. They put me in, a, you know, first grade. I didn't know anything. The kids used to make fun of me. I was 10 years old. Where we lived on 33rd Street, where the cathedral is, that used to be a library. So I spent so many days over there learning English. And finally, I kept skipping. Then they sent me from sixth grade to junior high, which was on 12th Street, and we lived on 33rd Street. And I finished high school here. We were the poorest of the poor, and we could not buy anything. We lived on what was given to us which were usually thrown away clothes, second-hand clothes. And uh, uh, we lived in a house that was full of roaches, uh, rats, mice. Uh, winter came, and I said we could buy no clothes. And uh, it was cold, and my mother fitted me with a coat. And it was fitted me nicely and it kept me warm. So I went to school. And I go to school, and everybody is pointing at me and laughing at me. And I don't understand what they're saying. So I came back, and I told my father. He knew English. So he went to see my teacher. And the teacher said that the reason the children are making fun of him is because he's wearing a pink girl's coat. When I s tell this story to young people, I say to them, uh, don't criticize anybody till you walk in their own shoes, like the Indians say. Uh, I was a poor boy. I had no coat. This was the only coat that would keep me warm. And uh, they, they were making fun of me. Today, maybe if I were, they wouldn't make fun of me. <laughs> you know, uh, Armenians have a way of adjusting and moving forward. And uh, I was quite successful in high school. I was a leading actor in the Shakespeare club. I did uh, Macbeth. I did Shylock in Merchant of Venice. I did Benedict in, uh, uh, in 
uh, is it Benedict and uh, what is that? Well, let me just name the Benedict. I forget the particular play now. And, and I did Hamlet. I did those in the Shakespeare Club. Every year we used to give a play for the four years I was there. Uh, then I went to Swarthmore College, and I graduated from Swarthmore College. They were in the evening class, one day the teacher asked a question. I put my hand up to answer. She says to me, all right, smarty. All right. Well, she said, all right, smarty, I know it's not complimentary. I said, what do you mean, smarty? You know, I got so bad. I went downstairs, complained to the uh, uh, man in charge. She came down and I put a complaint against her. I made her apologize for insulting me. I said, I didn't come here to get insulted. You asked a question, I want to answer it. Well, I went through all the miseries that a refugee has to go. I came in December. I went to the kindergarten. By next, I stayed all the way along. And then uh, the next sep uh, September, when the schools opened, I was in the seventh grade. They accepted me in the school, second class. In February, they put me in second class. I didn't know a word of French or English. The principal said, if you fail in English, you stay. You don't change your class. Finally, they let me go to the third class. The third class, I worked very hard to stay in class. In fourth class, do you believe that? I was the first in English language. I had the first, highest grade in English language. My aunt, not the one that raised me, but another aunt that was in America, she was an electrolysis. After I got married, she said, I mean, you should learn this. We call it, it's a gold bracelet, you know, when you know a, a profession. I learned electrolysis. I did it for 45 years, electrolysis, and then, 23-room motel. I ran it for 25 years, besides doing electrolysis. Like, it's a, it's a uh, seasonal. Uh, like, in the winter, I would take care of my girls, and then uh, what, before I went there, I would only come once a week for the people who really needed me. 23 rooms, 25 years by myself. Because my husband didn't like it. He wouldn't come. He wouldn't do anything. Except when it needed painting and all that, he would come, but you know, give me such a hard time and then do it. That's all. I loved it. I love people. This is why I'm saying that the survival part, it made me survive. People, people, uh, they couldn't believe what I was doing. All by myself. Didn't ask anybody's uh, opinion. You know, like when you go and buy a building, you look at the pipes, you look at this, you look at that, nothing, nothing. At that time, there was another good man in the diocese, Suret Manuelian. He said, take the newspaper, and there's a page for looking for jobs. Read the newspaper and see what job we can do, and go there. I'll take you. So I take the New York Times, Monday morning, I go to job hunting. I go one place, second place, I think, they said, okay, fill up this, this form. I fill up the form, 
Not the question, the other question, education, uh, it's a salary, this, this, this. I filled up, signed, telephone number, gave it to them. They took inside. You know, I was so happy. I thought that I was getting a job. <laughs> but they were interested, telephone number, so I thought I was getting a job. They called me inside and said, we'll call you when we, we have your telephone number, we'll call you. Disappointment? What is that? This lasted about one week, more than one week, maybe ten days. Finally, I sat down and I said, now, this is ten days, I'm going every day looking for a job, and nobody wants me. Am I so stupid? I mean, I know nothing, that they can't use me? I said, no. I have I have a rule for my life. See, I'm doing something wrong. There is wrong, uh, wrong transition from one to the other. I thought, I thought, I, I got it. A very I said, I found it. There was something wrong. That's why I was not getting a job. This is what it was. When you say previous position, after school, it says, uh, previous position. You know what I was putting? Office manager. Now, I learned that here, when you are office manager, you'll get at least the same job or higher when you change your job. So I said, George, who is going to hire you as an office manager? Your English is not very fluent. You don't know anything of the laws of the country. How you are going to fill up the job? I said, that's, that's wrong. Next Monday, I bought a book from Woolworth. It says, Bookkeeping Made Simple. I read that book. I had some notion of bookkeeping anyway. Bookkeeping, I read the book. I tried to learn in English, the French, English, the words of what I do. I went to an interview. Monday morning, I had a job. I had a job. Yeah. I job my job was, I was paid $60 a week. That was a good pay at that time. But uh, the other employees were not happy. They were jealous. They had to start with $25 a week. And after two or three months, my salary went up another $10. I didn't know why. The treasurer became very fond of a friend, a lady. He said, George, you know who is giving you this $10 raise? I said, no, the boss the owner of the company. I said, how? He said, he came last night after 7 o'clock, and you were working overtime, and he watched you working alone, so honestly. I mean, not killing the time to make it longer. You were working so, uh, with so uh, energy, so, so haste that he was surprised to see an overtime worker in that position. He was pleased. He's giving you ten dollar raise. Thank you. I worked uh, sixteen years as a technical writer and uh, worked for the government during the war, and then uh, I went to theological seminary at the same time and got my degree but didn't go into the ministry for 10 more years. I come to Detroit, look for a job. And here, there, here, there, I cannot find a job. Time has come, about 2 o'clock. I see one streetcar, you know, they're parking inside the road. They, they say that's a streetcar. They started to carry passengers from Detroit to the Pontiac. I walk in. I walk in, five minutes after, he come in, conductor. 
He says, did you pay for it? I say, yes, I paid for it. How much did you pay for it? I say, I paid 10 cents. He says, from 10 cents from Pontiac, Detroit to the Pontiac? Well, he opened the door, kicked me out. 4.30 afternoon. I walked from Detroit to the Pontiac, 28 mile, night. Finally, I make a shorter. So finally, after the year, I get a little job here, there. One of the ladies, she said to me, Mr. Agopia, now you go up. He says, if I look for another girl, you're going to marry? I said, how am I going to marry? I've got no place to live myself even. Don't worry about it. She put me in the car. We went to Detroit. He walk in, and then well, he tried to show me the girl who they are. And my aunt make a good speech about me. Oh, he's a young man, so so. As uh, the pre the pressure going to be over, so so. I said, don't believe it. My last words say to the girl family, if I marry your daughter, you know. She never going to work to nobody again, stay home. Finally, I married, had only $5 in my pocket. I stayed in the Pontiac until 1971. Finally, I moved to Detroit, I bought a nice house. One floor brick house, the house used to belong to the doctor. The doctor, he moved out, I bought another house. I had a job in a public school. I worked 22 years in the city of Pond, uh, Birmingham, maybe just not far away, Birmingham. I had uh, two children, one girl, one boy. It was impossible to find an occupation. Finally, I went to Jamaica, Long Island. They wanted a uh, watchmaker. So I went there. And he says, oh, so you're too late. There were 14 guys behind me. I was the first man online. I got so mad, I said, you SOB. Tell me you don't like my face, you don't my looks, you don't like anything about me. But I said, don't tell me I'm too late. I'm the first man online. I got so mad. Then I decided to go and look for an occupation. Couldn't get it. I'm passing a barber shop where I lived. And there were six barbers working, always busy. I went in and I said, I want to talk to the owner. The owner came. I said, I'd like to rent the window. It's for what? To the watch repairing. I put my bench. Well, we agreed. And I set my bench into the barber shop window because they hardly display anything to sell. So that started my uh, private business. And both of my grandchildren speak of me very well because I made a point that they learned. Blair and Rita went to Armenian school and the grandchildren speak Armenian fluently. Uh, my daughter did a very good job. She became a teacher in the American schools, and she did a wonderful job. And in fact, I'll never forget, she uh, had met some Odar boy, and then one night when I come home, I see this Odar boy in our house. Well, I was polite, courteous. After he left, I said, Rita, what's this guy doing here? Oh, Dad, because he's old and he's not bad. I said, I didn't tell you he's bad. But I wouldn't accept any order. There are a lot of good Armenian boys. You can go out with any of them. You're a beautiful girl. And then one night, Rita came home with uh, Simon, Simon Simonian, who was my son-in-law. I take one look at him, Pasha, I said, 
you know, Rita, I wouldn't mind having that guy for a son-in-law. <laughs> says, you know, Dad, I love him too, but I'm waiting for him to pop the question. They're married now since 1968. Wonderful marriage. Happy home. Huh? Mm. And um, parents didn't listen to me. He married an older girl than himself, quite a bit older. At that time, I was against it. I told him. But he won't listen. And that marriage broke up after 13 years. He ended up marrying an older. But she's a nice girl. And I made every effort to bring my children to Armenia. And to this day, <coughs> to this day, I try to teach every American Armenian that's born here, who has very little knowledge of Armenia, I said, look, read up about your background. Know where you come from. We have a civilization dating back five, 6,000 before Christ. I'm very proud of being Armenian. I never deny my background. I'll defend it any time and every time. It doesn't mean that every Armenian is perfect. My three children speak Armenian. They write Armenian. I used to send them Armenian to school. My grandchildren don't know. My aunt of knows, that have knows. Armenians, as a nation, they separate, they get together, they will never die because it's living 3,000 years, it can live another 3,000 years. Don't forget your nationality. Be an Armenian. Don't be, like, keep up your religion, keep up your music. Music never dies. My husband used to say to the kids, Listen, I get a large family. They didn't, weren't interested in Armenians. You can't force a person to do things. And the more you force them, the worse they get. I said, teach, speak Armenian. I'm not forcing you to do anything. Don't preach day and night, Hayastan. Learn your language, speak Armenian, learn the songs, learn the music, don't forget your language, learn your religion. I'm not a religious person. I love the church music. I love the church choir. I love all the Armenian songs. My mother, all day long she'd be working in the house, she'd be singing those songs. I wouldn't have known those songs. I used to sing and dance all day long. My son says, I'm not interested in the Armenians. What did the Armenians do for me? We didn't have a school to go to. We didn't have nothing. What do you want us to do? I spoke Armenian in the house. They knew Armenian. But outside, we were ashamed to say we're Armenians because they say, starving Armenians. My son has three children. Just a son got married. He's got three children, two boys and a girl. They, they speak Armenian, they understand, but with the Kharpetsi accent. They're not interested. Just recently, my son was taking pictures for the Armenian school in Watertown last year when the bishop was here. We didn't have a church to go to. How do you expect us to live, uh, keep our faith and uh, language? I used to go to a Protestant church, an American church, just to go someplace because my friends would say, which church do you belong to, which religion? I was ashamed to say, I don't know. I learned all this after I got married. My son went to a Catholic school church because all his friends were going to church. We don't have a church. My daughter went to a Protestant church because her girlfriend was going to a Protestant church and they were 
staunch Bolshevik. I couldn't say don't chum around with her. That's the conditions we, uh, we brought our children up. Are you happy that she married an Armenian? Oh, yes, 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 I'm happy. I'll tell you why I'm happy. I'm not a chauvinist. Uh, had she married a, uh, a Jew or a Italian or a Greek, I would be, if I do that, she was going to be happy. I was going to be happy. But there is always a friction point between the nationalities. And that creates problems. We are, the world is international now. Otherwise, if they are happy, well, there is no way to stop it. But they don't learn too much really from us. They don't learn our good traditions. What can you do? It's a, it's a melting pot, what they call it. it is. When I was 16, while I was walking to high school, suddenly I felt that I'm thinking in English and not in Armenian. It was, a, it was like a transformation. Now I'm thinking in English and not in Armenian. It's only when I found an Armenian evangelical church that decided to use the English language primarily and not the Armenian that I decided to go into the ministry because I felt that uh, if we were to adjust to American life, we had to use the English language as well as the Armenian language. If I asked you, do you hate the Turks, what would you answer? Oh, I certainly do. My reasons for hating is our misery that we had to, you know, live. I could kill them. Because all these things that ha has happened to me and everybody, it's, it's, it's there, it's them. I hate the Turks because we moved from our home. I had a beautiful home. We hate them. I hate them because I lost my mother was 38 years old. I don't like Turks. I don't know why I don't, but I don't. I, that the hate is in me, I guess. What they did, you know, that's terrible thing they did. Do you hate the Turks? Well, you can't help but after seeing what they did to our people, to see with your own eyes taken out of their homes put them out down in the street, march them away, never saw them again. I mean, what more could be real? That will always remain with me. Turks, I, I hate them. For me, I, I like them. <laughs> they kill my parents and think I hate them. But you know what my grandfather used to say? If it wasn't for the good Turks, we wouldn't be alive today. They came and warned them, please don't look for anything, just go. And that's what they did. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been saved. See, they were not all bad. But we came with nothing on, nothing, nothing, whatever we had on. No shoes. I remember walking barefooted. Everybody's lost someone, honey. Every army has lost someone. Everybody's lost. Do you hate the Turks today for what they did? Naturally, I do, but like I say, there's bad and good in every nationality. And you know, if you speak to a, a Turkish, I, I used to buy gas from, and he was a, a, a Turk. He was a fine gentleman, but still, 
that hate is there, the fear is there, the fear, yeah. So he was very good to me, madame, madame, madame. He always said, madame, don't you get up, because everybody has to fill their tank. He used to fill it, yeah. In order to, to say yes or no, I have to see the person, to see what he thinks, if he feels sorry, if he accepts. If he accepts and he feels sorry, well, I have to forgive him. But if he doesn't accept, well, he is the same Turk then. I mean, if somebody doesn't accept me, sees me, I tell him myself, my story, that I, I was there, a little boy, walking 3,000 miles in the deserts, no food, no clothing, nothing, nothing, nothing. Really. Shivering in the cold, uh, lost my parents, and you don't accept that this is not a deportation. What is? What was it? So if they accept, and they feel sorry, I think I have to accept. I don't hate, but I won't forgive him either. I won't forgive him. I don't hate anybody because they, if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it. I can say I hate anybody, but I'll never forgive them. They should apologize, first of all, what they did to us. No, I don't hate the Turks. Because, uh, first of all, hatred uh, is like putting poison in your own psyche. Uh, you don't, if you hate a Turk, you don't hurt a Turk, you hurt yourself. <laughs> so I don't hate the Turks. Uh, I treat the Turks like I would treat any human being. Any human being who misbehaves, I will try to stop that misbehavior. Any human being who kills ought to be punished or imprisoned. So I would make no distinction at this time. Uh, unless we break through uh, the walls of hatred uh, and uh, practice inclusive love, uh, the question of genocide is never going to be resolved. My only criticism of the Turks is not really the Turkish citizens so much as the Turkish government in its official denial of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, I point this out because I think this is uh, I don't think this hurts the Armenians. I think this hurts the Turks more because it prevents them from coming up into the class of civilized nations who are one after another admitting their past errors and faults and murders and genocide, like Germany has done so. And, uh, and the Pope has apologized for past mistakes of the Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, uh, why not? Why should the Turks? They deny it because they don't want to admit that they killed anybody. And uh, if they if they killed somebody, then they're responsible. And responsibility brings uh, certain uh, uh, certain um, remuneration uh, with it. They have to give up, they have, the Germans paid billions of dollars to the Jews for uh, indemnity. Well, the Turk will be indemnity, will have to pay indemnity. That they know too. And uh, they may have to return certain parts of our land in order for us to exist. I think they're afraid that we all might ask for our uh, belongings. They are dragging it so that eventually, it's 80, 85 years now, uh, eventually the next generations, generation after generation, the Armenian generation, will forget it. And the world will forget it. And that's the end of it. And they own lock, stock and barrel, whatever they set on it. The, millions and millions of uh, uh, dollars, billions of dollars worth of homes, 
properties, thousands of churches and whatnot, all national, uh, 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 national edifice, but they were built for thousands of years. All these are gone. One by one, they are keep on uh, ruining them. Why do you think they're still not recognizing it after so many years? Because they got to pay a lot, that's why. Dues. They got to pay all the Armenian votes. And they don't want to recognize the whole world. They were the guilty. They, they, they say it was a war. That's why it happened. There was no war. We didn't have no imitation. They died on the way. We're hoping someday a new government will come in power who will understand what happened and take, you know, measures. That'll never happen, though. To this day, they deny it. They will never admit their guilt. Look at how many generations has gone by. They will never recognize you. Because why? We have, they have allies sticking by them, like this country. This country feeds them, loans them money and all that. In Congress, Money talks, honey. When you deny something that has so much evidence as the genocide of the Armenians does, uh, you're loony. <laughs> you're off your beam. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. But I think they're coming around. I have a feeling that they're coming around. It's like a guilty person who finds it very difficult to admit his or her guilt. As a survivor, if Turkey recognizes the genocide, what, what do you want back? Nothing. My youth. Like, uh, I have a wonderful family. And they were very, very, very close. When I see, you know, the, the children and the mothers hugging and kissing and doing this and that, I never had that. I never had a father's uh, love. I haven't seen him. I don't want nothing from the turkey. What I want from them? What would I want back? <laughs> they cannot give back what I would like to have. But uh, it is not a, a realistic thing to, from now, to speculate about that, Archigas. Uh, the time, the circumstances, will bring as to what you want, what is possible to get. Otherwise, whatever is gone, it is immeasurably big, and you cannot get what you want. My whole childhood is over the leftover in the desert. I can't get it back, she can't it, so the Turk cannot give it back to me. My old family is left over there. Eleven members of my family is left over there. He can't give it back to me. So it's not a realistic question as to what we circumstances will bring and what we will get. That's another question entirely for the future. And future, I do not have myself. My future is a couple, couple of days, I don't know how many days, how many months, how many years. They owe us. 
they owe us because too much. They took all the money, they took all the property, they took all the house, they took everything, you know. So I figured out no matter how much they gave us, still they owe us. They can't afford it. That's why I think. They can't afford it to pay Armenian people what happened. If they recognize it, I would want a very clear historical record from their archives of what happened, number one. Secondly, I certainly would want the area of Ararat returned to Armenia, because Ararat is a Hebrew word which means Armenia. Did you know that? In the Bible, in the King James Version, where Arar is mentioned, it used the word Armenia. For instance, uh, the, the present translation says the Jewish spies uh, escaped into the uh, country of Ararat, whereas the King James Version says the Jewish spies escaped into the country of Armenia. Armenia is in several places in the Old Testament. So uh, I would want Arad back, and any Armenian who can produce a document of ownership ought to be compensated, and there should be a general compensation uh, to the charitable organizations of uh, the Armenians. Apology that the present generation of Turks were not responsible for what their elders generation did, right? After all, if my father committed a crime, I'm not responsible for that. All they had to do is apologize, and there's over $5 billion worth of Armenian wealth that was confiscated during the war that was sent to uh, Germany, and that money belongs to us with interest. We want what was ours. We don't want anything more than that, plus the apology. But I would like to uh, take some time to uh, uh, tell my hearing audience about uh, how, to, how to think of genocide. Because sometimes we think genocide is something way out there, you know. It, it's not here, it's way out there. Uh, first of all, let me say that there are five stages to genocide. And let me make this statement, and I will explain it. The seeds of genocide are in the hearts and minds of every individual. Let me repeat that. The seeds of genocide are in the hearts and minds of every individual. Here are the five stages of genocide. The first stage is identification of a people. The Armenians, the Jews, identification. The second stage is dehumanization. When a government decides to exterminate a minority group, they identify that group in various ways, and they dehumanize that group. The Turks call the Armenians gavurs, infidels, or dogs. We were subversives, we were dogs, we were infidels. We weren't human beings. Uh, the Nazis called the Jews vermin, corruptors of the German blood, and so forth and so on. Uh, so identification, dehumanization, segregation. The people to be exterminated had to be seg uh, segregated. The deportations were the form of segregation of the Armenians. The concentration camps were the form of segregation of the Jews, you see. So there's identification, there is dehumanization, there's segregation, then there's extermination, and there's denial, the five stages. And, uh, you know, when I lecture on these stages, I go into details with regard to the, each stage. But here's what I want to say. When I say the seeds of genocide are in the hearts and minds of every individual, here's what I mean. 
I asked a group of young people, have you ever disliked or hated somebody? And they all raised their hands, right? And since you have hated and disliked a person or persons, you have identified them. You know more about the persons you dislike than about persons perhaps that you know. So you identify them. Then I said, have you said some nasty things about the person you dislike? They all raised their hands. Because we do. For instance, look at what has happened with the black people. We segregated them into slavery. We call them niggers. Okay, we dehumanize them. We say they're apes, they're animals, you see. And we do this with people. We call a woman a whore, you know, we don't like her. Uh, we call a man a bastard, all right. So we identify those we don't like. We dehumanize them. We segregate them. I know many girls will say, if you call her to that party, I'm not coming. Or don't talk to her. Let's, let, let's not have her in our group. So you segregate them. And then I stop here. If you could kill them, you would. And I say, look what's happening in our schools. See? The stage up to killing takes place. And what do people do when they're caught? They say, I didn't do it. OK? So it's very important uh, for people to realize that the seeds of genocide are in the hearts and minds of every individual. Now, what are we to do to, to prevent genocide? We have to, we have to, in a sense, I'm a minister, we have to preach inclusive love. Inclusive love. Identifying people is neutral. We identify our friends. So say yes, identify anyone you want. Don't dehumanize them. Build them up. Say something good about them. See their good points. Tell them they're beautiful. Tell them they're intelligent. Don't lie about them, but everybody has some good qualities, even the disabled, even the, uh, those who are physically limited. They have wonderful things about them, you see. Don't segregate them, include them. Inclusive love, include them. And certainly don't kill them, give them life. And if I may speak as a Christian, our Lord Jesus Christ said, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. See, do this. And if you do that, you don't have to deny it. You can proclaim it from the housetops. I did it. I identified, I, up, I upbuilded, I, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I gave life, uh, I included, and then I don't deny it. I think you should do the same. So uh, I think uh, the solution to the fact of genocide is a transformation of human nature everywhere. The churches should preach this, the social groups should preach this, and everybody has to learn that uh, For instance, we, we uh, Armenians must learn that there are good Turks, as I mentioned, the, the uh, Mutasarif. Uh, Germans must, uh, Jews must learn that there are good Germans, okay? In fact, the Jews have recognized the, uh, what do they call them, the, the uh, worthy Christians, or they use another term, I think, those who help the Jews. The uh, righteous, righteous, righteous Christians, the righteous Christians. And many Armenians will testify that the Turks helped them survive. The righteous Turk, you see. Uh, unless we break through uh, the walls of hatred uh, and uh, practice inclusive love, uh, the question of genocide is never going to be resolved. I can sing. I, I can maybe. I I do sing my head a little bit, maybe. But uh, you, 
You can you have no breath anymore. But sing me something, a small passage. Yes. <laughs> Make a stigma. It it doesn't it doesn't come that way so easily. <laughs> Inspiration. Oh Hovarek. John singing. In fact, in the Abbey school, where we used to take singing lessons in a group, I was picked out to, not to spoil the rest of the group. Chelly <laughs> Dara be dis as hari. Drava dorar kain, i pet lehem karaki, or tik mort gan orte seg, ziva sen ver barnatal. I can't hear you. Almost sign of me? Huh? Your, your voice is nice, it goes very low. No, no. Oh! I, you know, one regret I have in my life, one thing that I am sorry for it. I don't have a good voice. Everything, more or less, I'm happy with what I have. Uh, writing, playing, talking, looking. I'm satisfied. I'm not. But voice, I, I feel sorry. I would love to have a good voice because that's where the beautiful human feelings are expressed in, in songs. Especially, I like some Armenian songs. They are so beautiful. They are so beautiful that uh, I feel sorry for those who don't understand those. Talat Pashan Pahal Berlin, Tehlerianer Hasawietin, Zarka Jackin, Pretz Ketin, Kunanis Achper, Kunanis Hamo, Hasian, Asiegesi Mechus, Ansildari. 